Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm Jen Bruton. I'm a partner in Venable's real estate practice group and I'm the relatively new chair of WAVE, which is the women attorneys at Venable, uh, which with the support of firm management is um, dedicated to the recruitment, retention and promotion of women attorneys here. The group was founded in 2011 and until recently, until this past year, it was chaired by my friend and colleague, uh, Stephanie DeLong. I took over right at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, first official act was to cancel our upcoming live event celebrating um, the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which was the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which finally recognized women's right to vote. And I hope we can have you back for live events soon. Um, just, you know, keep, keep your eye on your emails for those. Um, the good news is we've had virtual events, and the other good news about virtual events is that if you miss them, you can catch them later because they're all recorded. So most recently, uh, for International Women's Day this past March 8th, we had a, a conversation with Jill Weinbanks, the author of The Watergate Girl. It was moderated by Courtney Sullivan, who's a friend of mine and a partner in the litigation group here at Venable in the DC office. Fabulous event. Uh, before that, in July of 2020, we had a conversation with Susan Goldberg, who's the editor in chief of, the, of National Geographic. I also encourage you to check out that event. Um, through WAVE's efforts, um, we have grown the women in, in senior positions at Venable. We have over half the, the folks who come out of law school these days are women. Uh, but when you get to the higher levels, it becomes thinner and thinner. And I'm proud to say, and this may not sound as great as it, I'm telling you it is, but uh, about a quarter of all the partners at Venable are women and over 21% of the equity partners at Venable are women. Um, as well, um, of the new associates, about 68% of those are women. And this past year, over half of all the, all the folks elevated to equity partner were women. So these are, these are great, these are great strides. So we're, we're, we're doing what we set out to do just slowly, takes a while. Tonight's event is gonna celebrate both women and diversity generally. And, and I'd like to note with that, that June is LGTBQ Pride Month. And that yesterday at the start of Pride Month, um, Venable took down its flag in the DC office. We have the flag on top of the building and we put up the pride flag, which we will continue to proudly um, wave throughout the month of June. Um, upcoming in the month of June, um, Venable's LGBTQ affinity group will have two conversations that I want you to, to look out for. Um, the first is with advocate um, Judy Shepard, She's the mother of Matthew Shepard. She lost him more than 20 years ago when he was murdered in an um, anti-gay hate crime. Um, so that, that will be, I'm sure, really touching and gut-wrenching. And we also have a panel discussion on June 30th about gender identity and why gender pronouns matter. And so you can look for links to that on Venable's LinkedIn page. Um, you'll see these events, they're put on by LG, LGBTQ at Venable. Um, I also wanna note that yesterday and the day before marked the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre, um, which happened in 1921. And it's when a white mob um, stormed the city and killed hundreds of people and destroyed dozens of um, blocks of the Greenwood district, which was then known as the Black Wall Street. Um, we had um, through um, Venable's um, African-American affinity group, which is called the Venable Success Network. They put on an event in, um, February, which is Black History Month, um, with author John W. Franklin talking about um, remembering the Tulsa massacre. It was a book that he had written um, uh, with his with his father, and so that's great. And if you can catch that as well, we're gonna for the past events, for the new events you'll see them on our LinkedIn feed. For the past events, we'll throw up links to those in the chat function later on in this event. Um, uh, in addition, let's see Venables diversity inclusion group, which is chaired by uh, my, my partner, Nora Garote, who's also, she's the chair of the diversity inclusion group, but she's also the co-chair of the firm's intellectual property transactions group. And um, she hosted an event in May, which was, as you may know, Asian American Heritage Month. Um, and that event was 
uh, moderated by Whit Chang, who's counsel in a, in the litigation group in our LA office, and he had a he had his guest speaker Glenn uh, Magpante, who is the executive director of the National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance, and as well as a prof professor and a civil rights attorney. And you should check that out as well. It's also also a great event. Um, again, links will show up later in the chat in this in this event, or um, they may be showing up now. Um, but we have tonight for you what we think will be a thought-provoking and entertaining discussion. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Jill Rowe, who is also is a partner in uh, Venables Commercial Litigation Group, resident in the San Francisco office, and she handles commercial real estate and general business disputes. She spent 10 years as the election commissioner for the San Francisco Elections Commission. She is currently a trustee of the San Francisco Law Library. And... Um, She's currently representing as pro bono counsel, a woman, a low income woman in adopting her own nephew who has special needs and was abandoned by his birth parents. Jill has a special interest in advancing the careers of women, people of color and the LGBTQ community. And so she's really excited about this event tonight, which is WAVE presents generosity, serendipity and the beneficial use of power. And with that, I will turn it over to Jill. Jill. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, I am absolutely excited to be able to introduce you all today to the incredibly inspirational Drusilla Stender Ramey. Many of you know her already. She is a national leader in equal access and opportunities in the justice system issues. I'm going to try to keep her, res uh, her introduction a little bit short because it's uh, unbelievably impressive. Drew started at Harvard College where she graduated magna cum laude and then got a law degree from Yale Law School in 1972. She's had an incredibly fascinating career since then, starting in private practice at what Drew describes as a fabled old left law firm. She then moved on to the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund where she was counsel. After that, she became a professor and eventually dean of the Golden Gate University School of Law. Uh, during her career along the way, she served as executive director and general counsel of the Bar Association of San Francisco for many years, where she accomplished so much. And she also has served as the executive director of the National Association of Women Judges. Throughout this career, she has been a speaker and a consultant on diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. If you are an organization with a mission for justice and inclusion, you want Drew Ramey involved. Some, just some of the organizations she's been involved in include, include the fact that she was the first woman chair of the ACLU of Northern California. She was a chair of the San Francisco Commission on the Status of Women. She was a founding pre vice president of California Women Lawyers, the chair of Equal Rights Advocates, and a co-founder of the California Minority Council Program, the First District Appellate Project, and the Immigrant Legal Resource Center. Similarly, if you're an award that focuses on justice and inclusion, you've probably been given to Drew Ramey. She has received so many awards, I've only picked out a few here, but they include the ABA Margaret Brent Women Lawyers of Achievement Award, the California Women Lawyers Faye Stender Award, the San Francisco Business Times Most Influential Women in Business Award, the American Jewish Committee Learned Hand Award, and the National Bar Association Wiley Branton Award. There are so many more awards, but I really want to get on to talking with Juice Drew. So let me just uh, make a personal little introduction here, which is that I have so much respect and admiration for Drew as a human being, for her accomplishments and her stature, that uh, it can be very easy to be a little afraid of her and her career, but that is not who Drew is. She is somebody who makes everyone feel, as you can see from the look on her face here, that they're a part of her team and that they have as much to give her as they have, have to receive from her. Drew knows everyone and she's always willing to help. That's why when I uh, started talking with Venable about joining them, the first thing I did was ask Drew to lunch. I knew I would get lots of great stories, but I also knew I would get the real scoop about 
who the people are at Venable and at whether I would be happy here. I got that inf- affirmation from Drew. Of course, she knows Jim Nelson. She knows Angel Garganta of our office. She knows lots of other people. And she deeply encouraged me to come here. And I knew that I could trust that. And I have never regretted for a moment. So let's get started on what I know is going to be both an entertaining but also valuable hour. Uh, Just a heads up that we're saving 15 minutes at the end for your questions. So please do type them into the chat box uh, as as we're speaking and they will make their way to me and we save some time at the end for this. So Drew, welcome, welcome to Venable and thank you for spending this hour and 15 minutes with us. Thrilled to be here. I'd like to start uh, with the title of this program, which we titled Serendipity, Generosity, and the Beneficial Use of Power, because those were the terms that kept coming up when we talked about your career and the way things have happened and the way that you have been able to accomplish things. There was a fourth concept that sort of weaved its way in through all of our discussions, which that was that of risk taking and is going to sort of pervade, I think, all of the discussion today. But let's start with that serendipity and risk-taking idea. And can you start by telling us how you ended up in law school? Well, it starts out with an accident of birth. Um, My mother was a medical school professor. My father was a Kennedy appointee to the Atomic Energy Commission. They came from vastly different backgrounds, but basically always felt that you had to have a career as a woman as well as a man. And because of that, if... uh, if I had not gone on to law school or one of the other sort of terminal degrees, um, I am sure they would have sat shiva. So it was an easy and basically risk-free thing for me to do. Originally, I thought I would be my mother and I, uh, after a really unpleasant semester in college, I realized that uh, that was uh, not going to be and that left law. So that's how I ended up uh, in law school, but I had always felt that law was something that you could uh, used to do good and because my father had and uh, so that was for me. Can you give us a little background on the uh, uh, picture here? Yeah, well, this is uh, Kennedy swearing in uh, my father who's uh, to Kennedy's left. Uh, my mother is to his right and the, the girl with the hat is me and next to me is my brother and the others are the uh, other commissioner being sworn in. And it was, it was great fun, it was great fun. So. Anyhow, after that, then uh, I I was applying to law school uh, to enter in 1968, which was another piece of serendipity in a bizarre sort of way, because it was the first year that men could not get deferments from the draft to the Vietnam War uh, by going to graduate school. So many of the schools that had had more or less, let's face it, a quota on women basically had to uh, look a lot closer Uh, because they were afraid they wouldn't be able to fill their class. Now, of course, they underestimated the ability of privileged white men to get out of the draft, so it was a large-ish class. But nevertheless, it went up from a class of maybe five to seven women to a class of 23 women. And it was also in the midst of the civil rights movement. Uh, It was the year that both Bobby Kennedy and Dr. King had been assassinated. And in the following year, my second year of law school, uh, the women's movement really hit with a vengeance. So it was kind of a a time when a lot of people took risks. But for me, because of my family background, uh, one couldn't call it risky, but it was, it was serendipitous though, because it was, because if I had applied a year earlier, not clear that I would have gotten, gotten in. Uh, And it was a time when 3% of uh, the entire uh, lawyer population were women. It's now 37 uh, percent, but as was noted uh, earlier by Ms. Bruton, the fact is that uh, women have co- not come nearly as far as we should have. But it really is firms like Venable and and uh, other enlightened firms that I think will change the matrix uh, in, in not too long a time. So anyhow, uh, but in terms of risk taking, I, I had, could not possibly have left law school. Uh, or not gone to law school between college uh, and law school because my mother would have seen me as uh, chained to a stove in, you know, Milpitas or something. So uh, I waited until the middle of my second year to leave uh, for a year and, uh, and took off for uh, DC. And I, uh, uh, my first job was for uh, Ralph Nader, who's an interesting man. And, uh, and uh, a, cl- a fellow employee was a, a woman, uh, who was a, had been a newspaper reporter. So she got me to picket with her, 
pick at the Gridiron Club, which was the fanciest people in the press, almost, uh, well, it was white men pretty much entirely. And the president came each year, Statler Hilton, and those of you in Washington know where that is. So that is a picture that was in the first Women's Calendar and Survival Manual. Uh, and uh, and uh, the woman right behind me in the cowboy had actually got arrested. Several of the, uh, of the women uh, who were press women decided to get arrested in connection with this. But it was a, sort of a typical thing that was going on at the time uh, in women's rights. Uh, that was, I think, in 1969. Anyhow, I then uh, uh, went back after some other jobs, went back to uh, Yale and, and uh, and really had a good time. And my favorite anecdote about that uh, is uh, that a friend of mine called me, a guy, and he says, you know, uh, you owe me, which I did for some favor you give me. And he said, uh, uh, we're having a dinner of 10 students with the general counsel of the Department of Transportation. Well, this was 1969 and or 70, and the idea, you know, this was not interesting. But I went anyhow, because I owed him, and the guy uh, had been at the Cravath firm before he was uh, in that august position. And uh, so it was just as boring as it could be. And so finally, just to sort of zing things up a little bit, I said, well, uh, you're from Cravath originally, right? He said, yes, I am. And I said, well, I mean, how's discrimination going at Cravath? Because uh, an omnibus across the board uh, discrimination suit had been brought against a number of New York firms, including Cravath, uh, alleging sex discrimination uh, in sort of all of its manifestations, really. So anyhow, he kind of you know, bristled and said, we do not discriminate against women at Cravath, Swain and Moore. He says, why we bend over backwards for women at Cravath, Swain and Moore. So I said, well, isn't that interesting? Because I heard that one of your interviewers did just that with one of his interviewees here at Yale last year. And as a result, Cravath has been 86 from Yale for two years. And, you know, there was a kind of a ghastly silence that I thought uh, sort of outweighed what I'd said. But anyhow, I got home, my friend called me and he said, Drew, he said, that's the guy. That's why he was the general counsel of the Department of Transportation. But during that period, uh, we had started a women law students group, which was really the first year I think any law schools had and several did. Uh, the first Women in the Law Conference was held at Yale Law School, and we decided to start, as did several schools, including Georgetown, for example, uh, decided to start a Women in the Law course, and it was incredibly difficult to get the then dean of the school, who was a jerk, basically to agree to this, and because uh, he really only... Uh, wanted, if it was, if it was going to be that now, he would want somebody like Hillary Clinton. But what he wanted then was the one woman who had gotten a job on the tenure track of an Ivy League school uh, in New York or Columbia. Uh, but eventually we, we had that course and all these years later and all the women's groups later that I've been in, I have for 38 years uh, since the birth of my daughter, been in a group I call the Aging Civil Rights Mothers in Law Group. And we meet every year. Uh, for a weekend. Uh, it was founded by a now Ninth Circuit Judge, uh, Marsha Burzon and a bunch of us. Uh, so uh, sort of the women's, the solidarity of women of sort of my age group really helped a lot of people who were much more at risk than I was, who did not necessarily have the support of their family, for example. One of the things that we've talked about a lot is how it's it, things that seem ins insignificant in your early career can end up having tremendous importance. Can you uh, talk about risk take, taking or serendipity and how that worked early in your legal career? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Lady Gaga has said that uh, some women choose to follow men and some women choose to follow their dreams. If you're wondering which way to go, just remember that your career will never wake up in the morning and tell you it doesn't love you anymore. And that was always something that... Uh, that made uh, risk taking easier for me because I really felt that way. Uh, so the, the first way that serendipity uh, after my law school journey uh, picked up was um, I moved out uh, here to California from uh, New Haven because, well, everybody moves from New Haven, but because uh, frankly, uh, my, uh, my then best friend in the middle of the night says, don't go to Washington, you 
romanticize your mother who had become a national feminist speaker by then. Uh, you romanticize her too much, get out while you can. And I had taken a job in DC at the public defender office, but instead bolted uh, for California. So I walk into a dress store on um, Telegraph Hill and this uh, woman who was a New Yorker says to me, Christ, she said, you look like the wrath of God. What's your problem? And I said, well, I just moved out here. I don't really have a place to live. I don't have a job. The one guy I know is going to break up with me tonight and it's my birthday. So she dials, <laughs> she dials the phone and says, talk to Bill. And it was a guy who was from a prestigious small law firm. He said, well, why don't you come over and I'll look at your resume. So I come over there. He says, we don't do anything you'd want to do. Uh, you'd want to be on the other side of every case we have. But, he's, but as we're talking, in comes a partner of his who says, you really ought to apply to the ACLU, which for the first time was going to hire uh, a second lawyer in Northern California. And uh, I said, well, I know about that job, but the fact is I'm not qualified to require four years. I graduated you know, the day before yesterday. This was mid-year that I graduated. And he said, well, you've got some chance because I'm the chair of the hiring committee. So I uh, interviewed uh, and, and damn near got the job, which is, was, tells you, you know, what was going on then. But not too long after that, uh, a group of us young women who did not get that job got together and formed the first sort of women's committee of the ACLU because we decided it was time to take over the ACLU. And ultimately, after several years, uh, we none of us had quite the stature to really get on the board yet. But there was a woman, in fact, my husband's first wife, Faye Stender, who was a nationally famous prison rights litigator. And if she wanted to be on the board of the ACLU, they had to take her. So we went to see her and I basically said, you're gonna have to get on that board and, and bring the rest of us on. And she said, why, sure. So uh, she, uh, and you know, at that time, when you were a new lawyer in town, you know, you, you somebody, a lot of women who were a little bit older would call and, and uh, and get you involved in things. So uh, she had called me on about my third day of work uh, and said uh, that she wanted me to meet with a guy on death row at San Quentin. Uh, and uh, my, the fact that I was a member of the Connecticut Bar made it just fine. So I figured she owed me. So, I, uh, so she went ahead, she got herself on the board. She made herself the chair of the nominating committee, which is you and I have discussed is an incredibly important committee to be on. Uh, you can stack it, you can lead it, uh, you can get what you want from it. Anyhow, she made herself the head of the nominating committee. She came up with a slate. I was on it. And two years later, I was the first woman chair of the ACLU of Northern California. And later on, the guy was sort of the permanent vice chair because he didn't want to be chair. He was a very distinguished lawyer in San Francisco, was the president of the bar the year that I applied. And uh, let's face it, I had a leg up on that job. So you absolutely never know where a dress store lady is going to, uh, to take you. Uh, another example is that um, uh, Hillary then Rodham, who was a classmate of mine, uh, and another classmate, Mary Nichols, uh, said that, uh, that, well, that there was a small old left law firm in Oakland that hired women, and I should call them because she had worked there that summer. Fortunately, uh, nobody seemed to have dug that up when, when Bill was first uh, running for, uh, for president because it would not have sat well, I don't think. But nevertheless, it was a, a very interesting firm. Uh, it, um, uh, it, it had, uh, it, well, Angela Davis was a client of the firm, so I never even met one of my partners for that first year that I was there because she was one of the main lawyers on it representing the Communist Party. Uh, but a lot of the work that they did was just incredibly interesting. Uh, ultimately, you know, they really didn't have any money to pay me. So after that, I left and went to the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. But perhaps the most important thing for me out of that was uh, I met and uh, have uh, since been very close to my uh, uh, best friend, uh, Ronnie uh, Kaplan. And, um, and, you know, there's a wonderful quote about uh, best friends that says, um, you know, a friend will help you move. A best friend will help you move the body. And I think that uh, Ronnie would move any number of bodies for me and vice versa. And it brings me to another point besides nominating committees. And that is, it is just imperative, especially for women, people of color, the LGBTQ community, people with disabilities to really have 
friends that will help carry you through some very grim times. Uh, it's important for everyone, but it is especially important for people who are still marginalized uh, uh, in the society and certainly uh, in the legal profession. Another example of uh, serendipity was while I was at the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, I get a call from the then president of the San Francisco bar of which I wasn't even a member at the time. And he said, he said, boy, he said, we have our most prestigious committee is the Judiciary Committee, he said, and, uh, and we would like you to become a member of that committee. And I thought, isn't that nice? You know, sure, I'm young, but he must, he must see something in me. Well, what they saw in me is they thought I was a Chicana and they wanted me on, <laughs> on the Judiciary Committee for Racial Balance. Uh, and, uh, and I think I, I think I represented my people well, actually. So I came onto that committee and as fate would have it, um, the other two sort of non-big law people uh, who were on that committee were a man named Marvin Stender, to whom I've now been married for 40 years, and uh, Felton Henderson, who was an African-American lawyer who became a federal judge. And yeah, that was uh, 40 years ago uh, with me and uh, Marvin, the love of my life, and of course that led to my daughter there in the middle of that photo, who is, you know, the, uh, my cherished daughter and uh, uh, my grandchildren. And that's my latest grandchild, um, little baby Nico. Another thing that happened right in the middle of this time, and I, I, I think, you know, it reminds me of that uh, Tina Fey line, you know, just say yes, you'll figure it out later. I, I get a call from a woman who was one of the few women partners in the uh, in San Francisco at the time, and she called in a big firm, and she called me and she says, you don't know me, my name is Joanne Garvey, we're starting a women, a statewide women's uh, law association, uh, uh, we're gonna call it California Women Lawyers, we need, we need essentially public interest blood, meet us tomorrow at noon at the palace, just be there. So I was there, and, uh, and that's when I ended up, uh, the real title for, that I had with California Women Lawyers was, I was the first provisional second vice president of California Women Lawyers. And uh, that stood me in very good stead in many ways, not the least of which was that we did a slumber party to do the bylaws of that group at the house of Joan Dempsey Klein, who later became the uh, presiding justice of the entire California Court of Appeal, the senior providing justice. But, but much later than, uh, than her achieving that position, she had started a group called the National Association of Women Judges. And when I moved uh, to New York later on, uh, she basically insisted that I take the job as executive director of uh, that group. And it turned out to be a lot of fun, a lot of fun. So um, the last sort of risk taking thing that I thought I <laughs> would mention was that um, uh, my, I, when we moved to New York, I kind of, after uh, 17 years at the bar, I decided, my husband and I decided to just bolt for New York for a while, rented the house, and off we went. And uh, so it was, it was fun going to New York, but I was surprised at really how lonely I was. Uh, meanwhile, um, uh, my mother was, was good friends with uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who, uh, who went to see her because someone said she really ought to meet her, went to my mother's office uh, because she was in D.C. to argue uh, the case of Frontiero versus Richardson, which was an enormously important uh, case for women in the United States Supreme Court. And uh, so she went up to see her and after that, uh, they became very, very, uh, very good friends. So there I was in New York so alone. I go down to Washington for an ABA meeting. Uh, for the first time, I did not have a real position. Uh, and so I was feeling kind of uh, sort of, um, marginalized and went, a guy told me to come to a, a function for the chief justice of the Mexican Supreme Court. So I figured, oh, why not? So it was a big dinner. In the reception, I ran into Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who uh, my mother was very ill by that time, but we talked some about her a little bit. And then uh, I, it turned out the guy had not gotten me a ticket, which so I ended up on a table outside the doors of this very large dinner, um, along with several other losers, and was feeling incredibly sorry for myself when suddenly there appears somebody who says, 
the justice would like you to join her at the head table. So I went from the, the table outside the door to, uh, to the head table and, uh, and we chatted some more during dinner. Well, several months later, I was in New York, the phone rings, a woman calls, we had a, a very common name. In my defense, I have to say a very common name. And she said, um, I understand you're new in New York. And, um, and you know, at some point, if you don't say, excuse me, who is this? Then you know, you're dead in the water. Uh, and I get, and that, that once that point passes, you can't do anything about it. So I never told her that I had no idea who she was. And uh, so things got kind of worse because she then said, uh, when my husband and I like to go to uh, uh, dinner at her house. So, uh, so I said, well, sure. So Marvin and I go off to dinner and had no idea who this person was. Uh, it was just her and her husband. There was no one else there. She cooked a nice meal. Uh, we, we were trying to figure out from photos or anything who this was, but we had no idea. Uh, so um, at some point, uh, she mentioned that when her mother graduated from law school, she didn't get a single offer of a lawyer job. Uh, and then at some point she left to, oh, I don't know, answer the phone, I guess. And um, I say to the husband, I said, well, I said, uh, is Jane's mother still practicing law? And he looked at me as if, you know, I'd taken leave of my senses. And he said, Jane's mother sits on the United States Supreme Court. So it was, of course, Jane Ginsburg, and her mother was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And it was, it was um, a bad moment. And as we were leaving, the husband says, he says, well, essentially, do you go out to dinner with any Tom, Dick, or Harry who asks you? And I said, well, yeah, pretty much. So, uh, uh, but at, uh, later on, uh, to just show, you know, what happens with women. Uh, later on, she invited, my, Ruth invited my husband and me to a dinner party. And uh, I went up to her and I'd sent her a note, of course, and told her again how uh, embarrassed I was uh, about all that. And she said, you know, it's perfectly okay. She said, uh, it's life coming full circle. She said, your mother was very kind to my daughter when she was having a bad time. So, uh, you know, it actually, she was a very kind woman. And, uh, and it was, I think, though typical of... Uh, of women that that she would reach out like that. I mean, she obviously was a unique individual, but, uh, and I think that women have done that for me and I've done it for as many people as I can uh, as well, because I think we know better than, than the majority of our profession, uh, what it feels like to uh, be the odd, to be the odd person uh, out. So Drew, your career has included long positions uh, of power, such as the time that you spent as the executive di director of the San Francisco Bar Association, and the time you spent as dean of the Golden Gate University, and also all of these chance encounters and experiences that you've had. It, it strikes me every time I speak with you that you have always used those positions and those encounters to address racism and sexism where you can. So how, how do you do that? What is your philosophy about how to address those through, through, your, through your life? Well, you know, there's no question that women and people of color and other marginalized groups have less latitude than, than your average white guy does in this uh, uh, area. Obviously, you know, Tina Fey uh, has a great quote where she says, you know, a man has to be an ax murderer to be called ruthless. All a woman has to do is put you on hold. <laughs> so, so, you know, so there is the parameter who, no matter who you are, the parameters are somewhat uh, narrower, but I kind of learned at uh, the feet of a master, which was, was my mother. Uh, she had gotten involved in the women's movement because she had taken on uh, a high level Democrat who had said that, uh, uh, women could not, who was a close, very close to Hubert Humphrey, that women could not hold positions of high authority because of their raging hormonal imbalances. And uh, so she had debated him before the Women's Press Club and uh, as the Washington Post put it, figuratively speaking, mopped up the floor with him. Uh, it was a fun debate to watch. It started with his saying, he insisted on going first, which tells you a lot about the guy, but in a debate, but he, uh, he started out by saying, you know, don't get me wrong, I, I love women. And she said, well, so did Henry VIII. And they, and they were off, it was great, it was great. But one way to do it is to have enough power so that you can, uh, that you can have uh, that bandwidth significantly widened. And as, 
the head of the rank and tenure committee at Georgetown Medical School. She had a lot of, a lot of power and she could do this kind of thing. A guy comes in uh, to uh, the Department of Physiology where she was and says, uh, oh, and he was going to be a new professor there. He says, oh, he says, you know, I've heard about you. You're, you're the feminist, right? And she said, yes, and you are, and Dr. Jones. So he says, I have a joke for you. So all the men in the department say, don't do it. You will regret this. Just don't. But my mother says, go right ahead, Dr. Jones. So he says, how are women like statistics? And she said, I don't know, Dr. Jones. How are women like statistics? And he said, because once you get them down, you can do anything you want with them. And you know, does it live? A woman alive has not had some guy say, say, I've got a joke for you. No. So uh, he, uh, he looks at her and he says, what's the matter? He says, no sense of humor. So she says, well, you know, Dr. Jones, I took some psychiatry in my, uh, in my uh, studies. And the professor said that uh, you can tell an awful lot about a man's mother by the kind of jokes he tells. And she said, judging from the joke you just told, I'd have to assume your mother was a whore. And he looked at her and she said he had no sense of humor. And he said, you know, if you were a man, I'd hit you. And she said, well, if you were a man, I'd hit you. So having a mother like that, and that is a, a, a portrait of her uh, uh, many years after her death, the women of Georgetown Matter School, the, um, the graduates, noticed that there was not a single portrait of a woman in the entire Georgetown Medical School. And so uh, they decided to do something about this and they chose my mother as the first portrait. So that uh, now when you walk into Georgetown Medical School, the first thing you see is that, is that photo. So, uh, so first of all, you know, I, I learned obviously from, uh, from my mother, but I also learned from a lot of other people. Uh, for example, at while at the bar, um, we had spent an enormous amount of money and time on particularly racial uh, discrimination issues in the bar, which were then and continue to be huge. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, uh, having stacked a nominating committee just the way Faye Stender taught me, uh, we had our first black uh, officer uh, who was from a very distinguished firm and was a, an extraordinarily uh, talented guy and still is in every way. Uh, uh, and uh, so at the, there was an executive committee meeting, uh, a room of maybe 10 people. Uh, he was the only person of color. Uh, and an issue came up of, you know, the typical bar association issue of great moment, like who's going to be our next uh, representative at the ABA House of Delegates. So uh, given how much we were telling people like the people of Venable, what, what they should be doing, we said this should be, you know, a person of color, at which point, um, well, we would have said then minorities, at which point a white guy who was frankly, you know, not necessarily uh, the, the most distinguished lawyer in San Francisco, who was an officer, turned to uh, at me and he says, I, well, you know, I, I think I'm qualified for this job. I, uh, and I, I'd actually be interested in, uh, he says, but then he says, but I guess Drew wouldn't think I was the right color. So there was a ghastly silence in the room and all heads swivel to this uh, man who uh, was, the only, was the only person of color in the room. And, and he did the most effective, dignified thing I had ever seen. He turned to him and he says, you know how, he says, I know you didn't mean for that to come out the way it did. And he just lifted the guy up as they say these days. Uh, but it was a real learning experience to me that sometimes you tell a joke uh, if you can get away with it. And sometimes uh, you take um, that approach. Uh, I, um, I often found that the, the Bar Association ended up having, it was like I died and went to heaven. It had so much money uh, from the very people who had been on the other side of all of my sex discrimination and race discrimination cases uh, that almost anything I thought of that really might help in dealing with race, gender, LGBT, and disability discrimination uh, you know, I could find somebody who would uh, give me the money for it. Uh, and you could, and it's an, another lesson, you know, to younger women, you know, if something doesn't exist, you know, start it. Uh, or if something already exists and you don't think is responsive to your particular needs, take it over. Uh, an example of starting something new was uh, that uh, Clinton was just going out as president 
and uh, and we did not feel he had done enough in the race area. So as particularly with respect to lawyers. So um, we called him up and basically said, why don't you do what Jack Kennedy did in 1962 in calling the leaders of the bar together to the Rose Garden. And, uh, and that was how the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights was started. Uh, so he said, well, sure. So uh, I uh, was in charge along with Neil Katyal, who many of you know, uh, uh, with the uh, invitations. And, uh, and so I called up and left a message for the new general counsel of the Bank of America in Charlotte, who had taken over the San Francisco Bank. And I left a message saying, you know, we'd like, we'd like for people like you who care about diversity. I had no idea whether he cared about diversity, but we felt he should care about diversity. Uh, and we're having this event at the White House. And if you're interested, I hope you'll call me back. Well, in seconds, he called me back. And there we all were in the White House. Uh, and there were a lot of very distinguished lawyers there, but very few of them knew Bill personally. And I knew him pretty well. So, um, so there was a kind of a receiving line and as, as fate would have it, this B of A guy was right in front of me. He goes up to Bill, Bill shakes his hand, does the classic Bill Clinton thing of saying, you know, it's not just your money from the bank, it is your people, your huge resources, uh, human resources, uh, and I wanna thank you. So the guy kind of floats out into the next room, but not soon enough to not see me uh, get a big hug from Bill Clinton. And uh, so, uh, uh, as I was leaving and approached him in the next room, I said, uh, I said, well, uh, I've been meaning to tell you that the California Minority Council Program, which the bar uh, uh, under the aegis of uh, the then general counsel of Wells Fargo, Guy Roundsville, and I had started. I, I said, you know, we're having a 10th anniversary and the B of A, the old B of A has long been a magnificent supporter and I hope you'll want to uh, join in and, uh, and make a contribution here. And he looks at me and he says, well, I guess I haven't got much choice, do I? And I said, not really. Uh, so, you know, you can, <laughs> you can get people to contribute who uh, ultimately he became much involved in that kind of thing, actually, to his credit. And so often, you know, you can kind of trap somebody. Another example of uh, this is a woman came to see me uh, because she had been interviewing with a firm which no longer exists in uh, San Francisco, but a big law firm. And they had asked, her, some idiot guy had asked her uh, if she could be any color, what color would she be? And she was a black woman. And she had called the firm later and asked them to apologize for this. Uh, and uh, they had been very, very, very uh, uh, rigid about it. And uh, so uh, she came to see me. So I called up uh, the, one of the main partners in the firm that I had known from when I taught law actually and had him lecture for me. And I said, you know, I said, if, uh, if this woman has come to me, you can bet that this is gonna be on the front page of the legal newspaper, the recorder, uh, pretty soon. And uh, I, I said, you know, and he knew, typically he knew nothing about it, even though he was a very senior partner there. And I said, now when they do call you, don't you want to say that why we believe very strongly in supporting uh, African-Americans in, uh, in our firm, why we have just uh, paid the bar $5,000 uh, to help on the video that it is making uh, for about retention in, uh, of minorities in the legal profession. And he said, uh, he said, Drew, let me get back to you on that. And then five minutes later, he called and he said, we'd very much like to uh, make that, that contribution to uh, the film, one of Abby Ginsburg's first, first films. And, uh, and you know, it, but it was a win-win because it was on the front page of the recorder. And they were quoted as saying that they did have lots of things to support people of color. And uh, this was, um, was right there. Uh, let, lastly, on this topic, uh, the, uh, the Bar Association of San Francisco had such incredibly um, enlightened volunteer leadership from the big firms of San Francisco, uh, many of which don't exist anymore. Uh, but there was a huge uh, tradition of giving back. And so, and we did a big survey that very early on after I took uh, office that showed that, uh, that it was a very bad situation for racial minorities in the, in the bar in San Francisco as well as nationally. So as a result, 
once uh, I had met Guy Roundsville from Wells Fargo, that Wells Fargo and many other entities, entities like Venable, which wasn't there at the time, but would have been, I think, right at the top of the list of people who help, any, anything I could think of that might, and that the board could think of that might help, uh, we did it. So for example, we passed goals, timetables for uh, minority advancement. We uh, raised over a million in scholarships for people of color once the draconian anti-affirmative action initiative proposition 209 was passed. We uh, did a lot of work in uh, the women's era. We passed a model sexual harassment policy. We did flexible work time options. And uh, you and I have a discussion about this. We were instrumental in passing in San Francisco uh, initiatives having to do with discriminatory private clubs. And I, I'm proud to say that Louise Rennie, uh, ultimately we got her to, and she would have done it anyhow, I'm sure, to uh, sue the Olympic club because three of its holes, they discriminated against almost anyone who wasn't uh, you know, a, a Protestant white man. Uh, and certainly women. Uh, and uh, so when she was interviewed about the lawsuit, she said, look, you know, you've got, uh, you've got three holes on city property. And she said, you can have the best darn 15 hole golf course in the United States uh, and still discriminate, or you can stop discriminating and, uh, and, and have uh, the course in full flower. And they ultimately did uh, settle that case, although boy did tempers run high. Uh, and just now, right now, the, uh, the uh, Women's Open, the National Women's Open uh, is uh, going to be held at the Olympic Club, which I get a lot of satisfaction about. Uh, incidentally, I forgot to mention in connection with the Curvath firm and their, and their guy, uh, today, the uh, head of that firm is a woman um, of, uh, who is extraordinary. And uh, I think, uh, you know, there are some, there, there are some signs of real progress uh, that are being made. It strikes me that a lot of what you're talking about is separate and apart from your formal career positions and that it's more of you sort of making the right ask of the right person at the right time. And one of the things I've heard you say several times is that it takes very little from you in certain cases to do a lot for others. And I, I'm getting that from a lot of these examples that you yourself kind of harnessed the power of other people. Can you talk a little bit ab about that? Yeah, no, I mean, it's really, I mean, everybody does it. It's just that, um, I don't know, my, both of my parents really felt that to whom much is given, much is uh, expected. And, um, and they always said that it took almost nothing from you, just as you said, to really be able sometimes to uh, to change people's lives. And you also can get a lot of help in that. So for example, this uh, guy Roundsville, who came from uh, Oildale, California, one of the most racist towns in this country, actually. Uh, once he got involved in race issues, when we asked him to, when Dennis Archer, uh, uh, the first black president of the ABA asked me to ask him, and uh, he, said, he said yes, but once he got involved in that, I, when I would call up a managing partner and I kind of made it my business to just call up managing partners about once a month and to just raise issues of diversity because nobody else uh, really felt comfortable doing it. But it was, it, was, it was very much a theme of the Bar Association, but it, it was also something that, that I felt uh, I was effective at. And if I didn't think that they would care very much what I thought, I would say literally that, well, Guy Roundsville feels very strongly about this too. He did. I mean, you know, you can call that pandering, but the fact is uh, that having people with more power than you uh, uh, behind you uh, is important. Another thing where I, I, one of the easiest things for me to do is with women and people of color and other groups uh, from other groups uh, who are on their way up, but really don't have very much external uh, bases for self-esteem or bases for uh, calling attention to their partners, for example, um, I would set them up routinely with uh, people like Guy Roundville who would, who would see anyone I sent over to him to talk to him about uh, and make a kind of a pitch really, uh, uh, especially you know, if they were from a firm that wasn't already uh, uh, a client. Uh, 
uh, or already representing them as a client. Uh, and I would uh, send them to people like uh, Judge Selden Henderson, who was an incredibly old friend of mine, and to other people that made it so that they could, when they're talking to their managing partners, they can say, well, at lunch with uh, Judge Henderson yesterday and so on. And those kinds of things sound petty, but they can really, really make a difference. Um, and, and so, yes, uh, I did do a lot of that kind of thing, but again, it took almost nothing uh, from me. And in fact, um, people, my theory is that, that law and lawyers are like cops. Their job is 90% boredom and 10% terror. And so what I tell people is, you know, if you hit on the 90%, which you're likely to, they're gonna be happy to see you. They don't see a lot of young people. They do not see a lot of people of color. They don't even see a lot of professional women except in firms like yours. So uh, I think that, uh, that it is um, important um, uh, advice to give people to go to the top if you can. Uh, and the fact is you can most of the, most of the time. Um, I'm going to take that um, that quote about 90% boredom and 10% terror and make probably the worst segue uh, in the history of webinars. But we have uh, we're really fortunate to have our summer associate class on most of them watching today, uh, and we've got an incredibly impressive group of law school students. And um, I'm going to ask them all to completely ignore your 90/10 uh, statistic, but. <laughs> Uh, I would like to give you an opportunity to talk uh, particularly to these, these young people who are just joining the legal career. And we also have a lot of people who are not lawyers on the call, but people who are in their own professions to give advice from your perspective of how to deal with sexism, uh, anti-LGBTQ behaviors, uh, racism, in, in when they face it in their lives and in their careers. I know that you've You've thought about these issues a lot. So if you could give some advice, what would it be? Well, you know, first of all, there is a, a Mose Allison, and they will never have heard of Mose Allison, but a, a great blues singer has a song, a song called When Push Comes to Shove, Thank God for Self-Love. So I think it is very important, the issue of self-esteem, particularly for people from groups that have been largely excluded from the legal profession is huge. And I think it is, uh, it is important to, um, to kind of arm yourself against some of the things that are going to happen to you that you can't do very much about individually, but that will prepare you uh, for, for later life. And among the things, it's, it's sort of an indirect thing, but you need alternative bases for self-esteem so that when you face some of these slings and arrows, uh, and have a bad day at the office and come home, you've got this other thing going on. So for example, organizations like Equal Rights Advocates that is sort of my home away from home and led by the indomitable uh, Noreen Farrell, uh, public advocates, the ACLU, uh, the American Bar Association, and, uh, and, and you know, there's been a lot written about seeking out mentors, but if you have express questions like, for example, if I wanna get involved with the ABA, what should I do? Uh, because that will help you meet people that will protect you if something bad happens to you. And uh, so, you know, most people go out for these substantive law sections, which take forever to end up the head of. Uh, but there are all these commissions at the ABA that the people who want to be the president of the ABA put themselves on. And you want to be around people who have power like that, uh, because you will be able to uh, learn from them and you'll be able to uh, speak much more as an equal with some of the more people, uh, powerful people in your firm. So for example, I uh, got myself put on, um, well, a guy that was sort of unbeknownst to me just felt that he should put me on great committees when I first came onto my job at the bar. Uh, he said, you gotta be on constitution and bylaws. This is of the American Bar Association. I said, what? And he said, the men who want to be president, that's the committee they are. And sure, sure enough, the first meeting was uh, in Bermuda. The second meeting was in Palm Springs. And it was indeed full of the people who wanted to be and would be the president of the American Bar Association. Uh, and uh, those are the people who appoint 1,200 people to the fancy committees and so forth of the American Bar. And so I think, you know, mentoring is not... Uh, just telling you how to get through the firm, which is incredibly important, obviously. Uh, and sponsoring is the most important 
uh, of all. Uh, you know, if Ben Civiletti were still in the office, I'd say go straight to see Ben Civiletti and ask him to tell you, uh, tell you about himself and some of the advice that he'd like to give you. But, uh, but to, I, very often I found that the only people who called me as the executive director of the bar were white men and who wanted me to do something for them. People of color and women didn't call up. They paid my salary. I was working for them and these, the men knew it. But uh, the, uh, so I think that, uh, you know, uh, turning sometimes to people outside the firm and that's where these, the uh, specialty bars uh, as well as the internal groups like your wonderful uh, women's group and the others that were mentioned earlier are all well and good. But I think that, that specialty bars and so on uh, uh, can be very helpful as well. Uh, but, you know, uh, I guess the, the advice I tend to give is if you feel secure in yourself and you feel that you have the judgment to pick your battles the way you must, uh, that you are much more likely to be able to take someone on. I, uh, early in my career when I was at Maldiv, um, I was, uh, we were representing, we were suing every cannery in Northern California. And so it was a room of like 15 people, uh, all of them were white men except me. And at one point, the managing partner of the firm says to a secretary who'd come in, say, he said, could you get the girl out to get there to bring in some coffee? And all heads swiveled to me, the only woman in the room. And I said to him, well, you know, I said, Harry, uh, uh, oh, and he, oh, he looks at me and he says, oh, what the hell difference does it make? Girl, woman. And I said, Harry, if I have to tell you the difference between a girl and a woman. And, you know, <laughs> he didn't ask the girl to bring in the coffee for the rest of at least that meeting and subsequent meetings. But I could do that because I was from an outside organization. It's obviously much harder internally to do. But I think, you know, you really do have to... Um, uh, realize that the minute you went to law school, you became a leader. And as Napoleon said, leaders really are dealers in hope. And I think that, that there's a lot of hope in the legal profession. There's a huge long way to go, but uh, groups like the group, uh, your group right now that I'm speaking, that put this thing together uh, are incredibly uh, uh, important in reminding people that uh, there's strength in numbers and uh, that uh, you can, if you are willing to take just some risk, but really feel in your heart that you're entitled to take that risk and that you must take that risk, uh, that, uh, that you uh, will do better when people say or do incredibly stupid things. Like, you know, you just saw the head of the, uh, of the ABA medical journal had to resign over an absolutely idiotic thing that, uh, that one of their main editors uh, said. So, um, so I more go at it as a pragmatic thing of bolstering, bolstering up who you are uh, and really looking to fulfill your role as a leader uh, and, uh, and to bring up the people behind you. Uh, and the last thing I'd say is it, sometimes you will run into people who really have an economic problem, whether it's uh, somebody you work with in the firm or at, uh, at Maldeth, there was, uh, well, when I taught at Golden Gate, there was a woman who really did not have the money to pay for a bar cram course. And, um, and so, you know, I gave her the money and, you know, she paid me back eventually. But the fact is that to me, it was really very little. But to her recently, she said that, she, that it really made it possible for her to become a lawyer uh, because she was so much on her uppers. So I think generosity of spirit, of resources, uh, and working together with other people who are uh, both like-minded or will become that if you, uh, if you uh, get them to extend themselves is, uh, is to me sort of central to an answer to your question. I wanna um, hit some questions from our, our audience and I think they'll hit on some of these same issues. Uh, the first question that we got I love this question. What do you hope the next generation of women lawyers like your daughter can achieve for the broader movement of gender equality? Well, my daughter is the head of policy, which, you know, for a non for a nonprofit policy, for a for profit, it's lobbying. But uh, she's the head of policy uh, at uh, Equal Rights Advocates. And she, with the support of lots of her friends from law school and other women lawyers she knows, and obviously support of her parents, but 
uh, has been able to achieve a great deal. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I think that uh, it's, again, a kind of an attitude thing. You know, uh, there used to be this, um, this, this uh, Peanuts cartoon that said uh, about uh, that kid that had the curly hair, that naturally curly hair is a responsibility. Well, being a lawyer, and particularly being a lawyer from a more marginalized group, I think that uh, you, you need to know that you can, you can climb every mountain, and, but not alone. And that, uh, and that you, uh, and that there just isn't anything that you can't do. I, I was really struck by uh, uh, the managing partner of a very fancy firm in, in San Francisco when he was leaving his managing partner, approached a woman about thinking about uh, becoming the chair of the firm and she turned him down and he really regretted it. Now I'm not for a minute marginalizing, you know, minimizing the, the incredible problems with work, what's called work-life balance. Uh, uh, in fact, um, I feel that, uh, that you really kind of can have it all. You know, there's a, that, that wonderful uh, quote about, uh, you know, this is a very fancy woman got up to make a, a speech and said, uh, she said, this is a time when women like me who have it all say to women like you, you know, you just can't have it all. But she said, but you can, it's just what all is changes. And I think that, that you really it, you need to have the attitude that you can have it all. This particular one said, you know, this was Nora Ephron. She said, you know, I had three husbands and five careers. Uh, so yes, all does change. But I think that when women overcome, everybody is insecure in one way or another, obviously, but when you overcome that kind of feeling and really say, si se puede, you can't. Uh, and to not be afraid to change jobs, not, of course, if you're at Venable, who would want to leave? But in my, just speaking for myself, I was laid off from uh, two jobs and went to jobs that were better, uh, as a matter of fact, and I quit certain jobs. Uh, and there is, I'm not saying to jump necessarily from one law firm to another, but think about the fact that there are, that with a law degree, they will give you jobs that you are absolutely unqualified for and pay you well for them. And so, you know, I, you know, look at public interest, uh, look at public service, uh, look at running for office. Um, uh, so I guess that my advice would be, you know, shoot for the top, uh, uh, take risks. I mean, not ridiculous risks, take risks when you're in a position to, obviously if you have a sick child or something, you're not in a very good position to take risks, but, but overall uh, have the confidence in yourself and have a best friend that tells you you're wonderful. And, uh, and, uh, and for you young women, I just wanna say that one of the big mistakes I made, uh, I think was to think that, uh, that I just had to have a, a, a man at my side or if I'd been uh, uh, gay, I would have wanted a, a woman at my side. But I really felt uh, kind of bad about that uh, until I got into my 30s. And what I didn't realize was that I actually had pretty carefully structured my life so that I only went out with men who really didn't care whether I lived or died. And when I finally decided I did want to settle down, uh, I, uh, I ended up uh, hitting, hitting the jackpot. But you know, on the way, I went out with any number of powerful lawyers, <laughs> all of whom owed me by the time I got to the bar. Uh, you know, uh, so, uh, you know, but don't think if you don't happen to be paired up uh, that you need to be, uh, you know, anything that you want in the way of a social life will come to you uh, in, in good time. And if you don't have somebody that you really, who relies on you, you have, you have more freedom uh, to take risks, let's face it. So I'm not recommending late marriage, but, it, it, but don't worry about it so much, I guess. It worked for you. Our second question here, uh, I drew interested whether you have any comments or insights on how wardrobe, including use of colors and hats, have figured in your professional life, your brand. Any, any advice on the same for other women? Oh, yes, especially when I was dean. I always was on a panel with a woman who kind of dressed in sackcloth as one of the tenure professors. And I, uh, <laughs> I actually later gave her... Um, as a present, um, a personal shopper uh, who who took all of her old law school stuff. She'd been out of law school for twelve years or something, and just threw it out. And said, "Boy, do you need me?" And uh, and really, it, it it changed her motif. It was really interesting. I think that women, one of the few edges that women have, 
you know, aside from brains and so on, is that you can wear bright colors like you and I are. You do not have to dress in black, brown, olive green, uh, or, you know, sackcloth. And, and, and so, you know, you don't wear stuff that's provocative, obviously, but to wear, you can wear stuff that really looks good on you. And, and uh, so I think, you know, a personal brand involves wearing things that you really feel good about that you think make you look good. I ended up with hats because I was on my way shortly after I went to the bar to ask a managing partner who was deeply distrustful of anybody who'd been the head of the ACLU for money, for something. And on the way, I saw a hat rack in the window of a store. And I figured, that's it. So I went in, I bought a hat with a veil. I went to see the guy, I walk in, he didn't know what to do with the hat, he just, especially the veil. He just didn't know what to do. And it put him just enough off his feed that I could get in my request and before he knew it, he said yes. You know, so I, I do think that it's, a, it's an equalizer to have a, uh, a brand that, uh, that, you, that makes you feel singular. Uh, a lot of women say to me, you know, I just, uh, I don't, I can't wear a hat. And I said, well, it's really simple. You know, you just buy it and put it on your head. Uh, and lately I've been, you know, I've been, in trying to be Kate Middleton. I have gone in more for, um, for much lighter weight uh, headgear. But the fact is that um, I think brand is important, but it has to be something you feel comfortable about. On the other hand, if what you feel comfortable in is, you know, a, 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 Louse up to here with a bow uh, in white and a black suit, and uh, that's it. You know, uh, experiment some uh, and uh, and see if you don't look better in a brighter in a brighter color. Uh, so it all has it all it it. I didn't mean at the time for it to become a kind of a fixture for me, uh, hats and fascinators, but uh, but it has been, and it's fun. And, and and truthfully, it is men who still run this profession, with a few major exceptions. Uh, uh, and, uh, and men like hats. We, we just have a few more minutes and, um, I, I would like to ask you if there's anything in particular that you would like to say in closing to our group today. I think I'll, before we do that, I'll just thank you so much for your time and your advice and your thoughtfulness today. Well, uh, you know, my mother was very close to Gloria Steinem also, and Gloria it, uh, insisted that she have an article in the very first issue of Ms. Magazine called Men's Cycles, They Have Them Too, you know. And, uh, and what she wrote about my mother in her eulogy to her after she died is that she said, she never failed to show and to say that her beloved family and close friends were more important to her than all the external trappings of success and made very clear that kindness was the most important quality in life. So what I'd like to close with is, uh, and I should have said this earlier, the incredible importance of kindness. You know, it really, it's a, uh, it's a precious, precious commodity. And my mother had an article in the only good thing US News and World Report ever did, which was a book of uh, asking people like her to say a let to do, write a letter to their children and grandchildren. And my mother wrote this and it made a secret service agent cry. She said, at this stage in my life, I don't do much agonizing about mistakes I may have made. It's not the stupid things I did that disturb my sleep. It's the things I didn't do, the words I never spoke, the little kindnesses I omitted because I had my eyes on a goal and I was running so fast to get there. The most painful memories I have are of my mother's pain because she couldn't buy me that special dress because I had to work at menial jobs after school and wear unfashionable cast-offs. I never told her how unimportant all those things were to me compared to the priceless gifts she had given me of an unwavering love and confidence. I thought she knew. And by the time I learned the need for words, there were no longer ears to hear. I learned too late that words can be weapons or they can be life enhancing. I have in my life received honors and honorary degrees. And every time I stand up there, I feel my mother is beside me saying, see Stella, I told you to get an education. And I say at last, thank you for everything you gave me. If I could leave you with any advice, she closed with, it would be to speak words of caring, not only to those closest to you, but to all the hungry ears you encounter on your journey through a cold world. Stop on that mountain climb to bring along those others who are less agile, less well endowed. It will make the view even more beautiful when you get to the top. 
Thank you so much, Drew. It's been a real pleasure getting to know you more through this experience. And again, I thank you so much for your time and your insight. Um, I know we will be in touch. Uh, I know there's a lot of people watching who know you well and will be in touch. Uh, all I can do is express gratitude on behalf of all of us. Thank uh, you. My great honor. Thank you for inviting me. And good luck to all of you. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for joining us.